On April the 19th, 1995 at 9am, Timothy McVeigh, an American Gulf War veteran, parked a rental truck containing a homemade bomb outside the Alfred P. Murrah building in Oklahoma City and lit the fuse. At 9.02am, the bomb detonated. A massive car bomb exploded outside of a large federal building in downtown Oklahoma City, shattering that building, killing children, killing federal employees, military men and civilians. In a matter of seconds, the blast destroyed most of the nine-storey concrete building, which included a daycare center, leaving 168 people dead and hundreds more injured. But the question on everyone's mind was why? What motives could Timothy McVeigh have had to commit what was, at that time, the most devastating terrorist attack on American soil? This is the story of the Oklahoma City bombing. Hello and welcome back to The Last Supper, where this week we're going to be looking at the strange calculated life of American terrorist Timothy McVeigh. A true catastrophe which rocked the United States to its core, McVeigh, a gaunt and emotionless figure, never showed a flicker of remorse for his actions which ruined the lives of thousands across Oklahoma and afar. He quite rightly received the death penalty and will be recreating the poker face killer's last meal on death row a little later, so do like the video, subscribe and stay around for that, but first, let's look at why he was on death row in the first place. As the black smoke cleared from over Oklahoma City, caused by a lethal explosion of a homemade bomb outside the Alfred P. Murrah building, the true devastation of this blast was more clear to see. Hundreds of civilians lay bleeding and injured on the ground, 168 people were confirmed dead, 19 of them children. There were 342 buildings damaged or completely destroyed. The impact of the bomb left a 16 block radius of destruction, reducing most structures to rubble. The surrounding area looked like a war zone, cars were incinerated, buildings were on fire. Coming just after the World Trade Center bombing in New York two years earlier, many Americans immediately assumed that the attack was the work of Middle Eastern terrorists. Truly the darkest day in Oklahoma City's history, one that turned an even darker shade when they found out it was one of their own. Beneath the piles of concrete and rubble, there were clues to who committed this catastrophe. On April the 20th, the rear axle of the rider truck which was carrying the homemade bomb was located and the vehicle identification number was traced to a body shop in Kansas. Employees at the shop helped the FBI quickly put together a composite drawing of the man who rented the van. Agents showed the drawing around town and local hotel employees supplied a name, Tim McVeigh. Astonishingly, McVeigh was already in jail. He'd been pulled over about 80 miles north of Oklahoma City for a missing license plate on his getaway car, where it was swiftly discovered he had a concealed weapon and was arrested just 90 minutes after the bombing. From there, the evidence against Timothy McVeigh swiftly began adding up. Agents found traces of the chemicals used in the explosion on McVeigh's clothes and a business card on McVeigh which had written on it, TNT at $5 a stick, need more. During interrogation, they quickly learned about McVeigh's extremist ideologies and his strong hatred of the federal government. Once they discovered this was his motive, it was plain to see why Timothy McVeigh targeted the Alfred P. Murrah building. It was full of US government workers, 14 federal agencies had their offices there and 98 of the victims on the day worked for the federal government. But where did this hate of McVeigh's stem from? To understand that, we need to delve deeper into the life of our perpetrator. Born in Lockport, New York, McVeigh grew up in a working class family and served in the United States Army from 1988 to 1992. While serving in the military, Timothy McVeigh met a man in basic training at Fort Benning called Terry Nichols in 1988. That same year, McVeigh became a candidate for the Special Forces but dropped out just two days later. He later reunited with Nichols and they bonded over their mutual anti-government sentiments. McVeigh's distrust of the government began in high school where as a teenager, he read the Turner Diaries by William Pierce, the leader of one of America's most prominent neo-Nazi organisations. The book outlines a fictional Aryan revolution against the federal government. The opening scene of the Turner Diaries is eerily similar to the Oklahoma City bombing where it reads, We will then drive into the FBI building's freight receiving area, set the fuse and leave the truck. McVeigh's and Nichols' radicalisation was influenced by their growing distrust of the federal government, which they believed had overstepped its bounds and violated citizens' rights. The catalyst for their violent actions was the Waco siege in 1993, where a confrontation between federal agents and the Branch Davidians' religious sector resulted in a tragic loss of life. 
This event fueled their anger and resentment towards the government and in September of 1994 they began plotting to destroy a federal symbol and they chose the Alfred P. Murrah building and carried out an attack on a scale that America had never seen before, striking fear into the hearts of the nation. In the summer of 1997 McVeigh was tried and convicted on 11 different counts and sentenced to death. Whilst on death row, he requested a last meal of two pints of mint chocolate chip ice cream the night before he was executed by lethal injection on June the 11th, 2001. And to recreate his last meal, we first need to start by taking 140 grams of good quality dark chocolate and placing it in a zip line of food bag and freezing for 30 minutes. This is to make the next part of the recipe easier, which is bashing the f out of it with a rolling pin. I then realised that it'd be much easier if I did this whilst the chocolate was inside of the bag, so painfully place each shot of already bashed chocolate back into the bag and continue bashing the fudge out of it. Once the fudge has been bashed out of it, place to one side and pour 300 milliliters of double cream and 400 milliliters of full fat milk into a pot, eyeballing this as usual. We then want to give that a stir with hot pink spatula before splitting a vanilla pod like this and scraping the seeds out with a spoon. Then adding this to our creamy milk mixture. Heat the creamy milk, stirring now and then until it's almost boiling. At that point we want to add 75 grams of mint, stalks and all, cover with a lid and leave for 15 minutes. I guess in this time you could prep the other ingredients or you could apologise to the neighbours for the aforementioned chocolate bashing which surely woke them up. After apologising, strain the lid using a sieve and pressing the mint with hot pink spatulas to extract maximum flavour. We then want to add 140 grams of caster sugar in a bowl and if you don't have scales like me that's about 10 tablespoons. When you finally have the right amount of sugar in the bowl we want to add 4 egg yolks which we can separate from the white by tipping in and out of the cracked eggshell like this. This is quite labour intensive but we need to whisk the sugar and egg mixture vigorously for around 5 minutes. Luckily I've got quite good stamina in this arm for some reason and once that mixture is pale and thick like this we want to return the mint cream mixture to the pan that we have rinsed out and once again heat until nearly boiling. Pour half the hot minty cream mixture onto the egg and sugar mixture, whisking to combine everything before adding the remaining liquid. We turn our custard to the pan and we want to cut this on a medium heat for around 5 minutes, continuously stirring until lightly thickened. Let this cool now, stirring occasionally so it doesn't form a skin and chill overnight. It's now the next morning and our minty creamy custard is sufficiently cooked so it's time to whack out the ice cream maker. Pour in the custard with a helping hand from Hot Pink Spatula, have a wrestle getting the lid back on and finally turn the ice cream maker on. Wait until it's churning nicely before adding our bash the fudge out of chocolate and continue churning. Once you can see the ice cream on level with the paddles through the lid like this, we can then transfer it into a freezable dish. I'm just using a meal prep Tupperware and leave in the freezer for around 4 hours. Scoop a few scoops into a fancy ice cream glass, decorate with chocolate wafers and some reserved mint leaves. Get a pick for the gram and the memories and there we have it. The last meal of Oklahoma City bomber, Timothy McVeigh. Not gonna lie, this is probably the best ice cream I've had, much better than the ice cream I made for Elvis's last meal and one which would have probably temporarily relieved the thought that I was quite rightly receiving the lethal injection the next morning. Quickly removing any chocolate pieces from the spoonful of ice cream, fetching our world renowned taste tester and yes, finally, after weeks of being camera shy, he agrees that this ice cream is fit for a king, aka my chihuahua called Teddy. Please do like the video and subscribe to the channel if you enjoyed it, it really does help with the algorithm. Thanks a lot for watching, as always let me know in the comments below whose last supper you'd like to see next and I will see you in the next one.